Hey everyone, welcome to another community call. Today we have very interesting items on the agenda and we'll start things with discussing the uh, importance of the editorialized titles. And so editorialized titles are essentially the your own version of the title for the paper you could upload to Research Hub. If you think that the title that you know the original offers might be a little bit too technical for you know irregular users to uh, unfold, then you can opt in to coming up with a more simplified version of the title, so to say. And it's my understanding that not a lot of people use editorialized titles right now. And so I'd like to bring up the discussion of maybe people can share whether they tend to not use them or use them and do they find the titles of other papers from other hubs a little confusing or is it fine as is things of that nature lynn um i find them confusing i think it's weird to rename a paper um i don't know i just found it because i've clicked on some papers with editorialized titles and thought at first that it was linking to the wrong paper until I realized that it was an editorialized title because it had one title like displayed then I clicked and the paper had a different title so just like for me I find it confusing because it's hard to be sure if it's the right paper if it took you to the wrong paper if it's an editorialized title I don't know I never use them personally would it be less confusing if if the website would be a little bit more upfront about the difference between the regular title and it realized maybe they could be put back to back next to each other or something. But then what each paper has two titles. I, I personally just don't see the point of editorialized titles, but I guess I, we could hear from other people. So okay. I think the, the thought process behind them. And I actually agree with a lot of your comments, Lynn, like I find it like to be um, sort of tedious when a paper is in my field. But then, like, sometimes people post things about, like, quantum physics or something where I have, like, literally no idea if you're going to add, like, technical details and they're helpful. So I think, like, the thought process is, like, um, SciComm to try and, like, sometimes authors of papers will title things in a way that are very, like, I think the audience are other experts in their field. And we'd like to, like, create an opportunity to help make science a little bit more, like, um, accessible to the average person. In, in theory, that's like the thought process. Oh, yeah, I definitely get the process. The, you know, I, I get the idea behind it. Um, you know, it's just my opinion about it. Nick? I think uh, I've used the editorialized <clears throat> title functionality once so far. I think uh, conceptually it's a great idea to kind of bridge that gap and make things more accessible. I just think if we're going to go with that feature, it could be implemented a little bit better. So maybe perhaps keeping the paper's actual title the same size. And then if there is a jargon free or editorialized title, maybe having that like a small text below it or something, just so it's very, very clear when you look at it, okay, this is what the paper is actually called. And if you're one of those people that might not know all that jargon, you can see the editorialized below. But right now it, when you put an editorialized title, it replaces the original paper's title completely. So I think, maybe conceptually it's a good idea it just could be implemented in a much clearer fashion um, for the readers i agree with you personally on i think if there is a way to put back both, both titles so that they're accessible i think that would be best but obviously implementation is tricky here uh, olga yeah my my biggest beef with uh editorialized titles is a hypothesis feature so if you are trying to do the hypothesis and you are trying to find the papers you uploaded uh, in favor or against your hypothesis you have to remember editorialized titles that you used which is a, an absolute pain in the neck <laughs> uh, and it's i kind of i tried to use them whenever possible for like some time and i still try to use them when i feel like the original title is very long and very like heavy and i sometimes make it more clickbaity or like put the actual finding in the title like x is associated with z um, which may or may not be a good idea and i'm open to 
any constructive criticism about it. Uh, but but yeah, sometimes it's like hard to understand how simple you should make it because you are also a person who does it every day. So do I avoid a word correlation? Do people know what correlation means, right? Do people understand this word? Do I leave it in the title or do I find another word? At the same time, I feel like in quantum physics, it doesn't really matter what title people use. I will not be able to understand it. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know. I feel like there are pros and cons to that. And I agree that it would be great to leave uh, a paper like meta uh, info about paper with original title and being able to search by original title and digitalized title at least. Yeah, yes. no, it makes sense. Just to jump right. in, this is like fantastic feedback. I think the the point in the hypothesis feature, I've experienced that myself, and it's such a pain because you're never ever gonna like even if you search on Google, like you can't search for the editorialized title. Like, so that that search function definitely needs to be like applicable to both. Yeah, you know, I and actual. I ended up going into my profile and opening up the history of everything I uploaded and figuring out what papers I uploaded and with what titles. And when there there will be hundreds of this paper, it will not be possible, <laughs> of course. Totally. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. I think we can definitely fix that once we start uh, kind of like putting our attention back on the hypothesis feature. Well, one thing we do plan to do here within the next sprint or two is uh, redesigning the paper page. Because uh, we got a lot of good feedback about like authors versus submitters, and we want to like basically put more emphasis on the authors. And I think this is kind of in the same vein where like the initial publication needs to be the star of the show, and there can be like some research hubby stuff kind of like around it. So we'll we'll do designs um, where the regular paper title has more like emphasis on the page, and the editorialized title is maybe like um, like less uh, I guess highlighted. So two thoughts I have too. We talked a little bit about like having a toggle of like expert mode versus like layman's mode. Like we could in theory do something where like based on your uh, reputation each in each hub, like if I'm in molecular biology, like I'll still see all the jargon, you know, and like the actual paper titles. But if I'm browsing quantum physics, then maybe like my account automatically switches over to layman's mode or something like that. So, so that's a potential like idea there. I think it's a decent amount of engineering work. And then the last thing that I wanted to do is like, for one second, just uh, drill down on Olga, what you were saying with like, in the editorialized title, you actually put what happened in the paper. Like to me, that seems like way more interesting than even an editorialized title. Like X is affecting Z, right? Like that's, that's like what you want to get out of the paper. I'm not sure if a lot of papers can be like broken down to one, you know, statement of like, what are we doing here? But that to me is even more interesting than an editorialized title is like, what does this paper say? And, you know, one sentence that anyone can understand. Yeah, I'm basically, sorry if I'm taking so long. Uh, I'm basically was trying to treat editorialized titles as like, you know, uh, like names of subreddits or like names of posts kind of ish so it's not about like actual name of the paper it's something to like bring attention to the paper and maybe i just thought about it maybe it's a good idea to actually not make it a paper title but like post title instead yeah we, we actually had some other copy i forget i have it written down somewhere but editorialized isn't ideal because even that is kind of jargon you know which is like so, so something just cleaner and simpler. Um, so I guess overall, totally agree on emphasizing the actual paper title. Um, and then maybe we can do something with editorialized titles where it's a little bit, yeah, jar jargon-free titles. That's good. Um, yeah. And then Antana, I agree with you. I missed the key takeaways too. I, I think those will hopefully make a reappearance someday. Um, cool. Thank you, Olga. That was great feedback. Lane, would you like to add something? Yeah, um, one thing Olga mentioned that uh, is actually a good point. So I definitely agree with like it, um, editorialized titles would be fine as long as we highlight, you know, the main title, whatever, because another thing that could be an issue, like Olga mentioned clickbait titles, which is like not a problem when like editors do it, but could obviously become a problem, you know, for like 
people who aren't like as invested in the community could just post like really sensationalized titles that might be misleading, et cetera, just to get like clicks and views. And we've already seen that people are willing to like give up votes and stuff to papers that they haven't read just like based on the titles. So sensationalized titles that aren't necessarily accurate uh, might get a lot of upvotes. Yeah, I guess so. So that problem, um, I think everybody can edit the editorialized title. Like it's not just the person who submits it. Like it's almost wiki style. Like anyone can go in there. And so uh, I think what happens, because I have posted plenty of outrageous clickbait titles trying to get traffic from Reddit to Research Hub. And so whenever I say something that like isn't representative of what's in the paper, um, the moderators of our science will take it down. Like they'll just delete my post. And so it's kind of like human moderation um, can combat like some of the bad behavior that could come out of like uh, people trying to do clickbait. Yeah, it makes sense. Nick? I just had something quick to add because I think the edit, the, the feature is a great idea. I just, it's not commonly used. So it could be, you know, it does give you the option to change completely how that paper may be seen. So it could be, I don't think it would be a lot of work given that people may not use this functionality a lot, but it could be something where, you know, when you post the paper, DOI pulls the actual title and then the editorialized title that someone may propose could just need approval from a hut, an editor of that hub just before it goes up kind of thing. Oh, I like that. That's pretty good. So it'd be like gated behind like an editor check mark, basically. Yeah, yeah. And I, I don't see I don't see editors really getting swamped with a ton of that workload because it would be kind of a few and far between thing, but just as sort of nipping that in the bud were people to use that editorialized title for you know nefarious reasons or anything like that. Yeah, I like that a lot. Um, one thing I've been thinking about when it comes to editorialized titles is the journal eLife. Like they do a really good job of just all their titles are very understandable. And then when you click into the abstract, you know, it's it gets technical. But I think it's just their editorial team works with the authors and is like, hey, like we want the titles to be like understood by anyone. And so yeah, I'm I'm thinking we could probably do some stuff like that for what's published through Research Hub. But um, yeah, having we're going to build a dashboard out anyway for editors to be able to do lots of different things. And I think it makes a lot of sense to have this be another like, it kind of is an editorial decision at the end of the day, what title appears like within someone's hub. So that makes a lot of sense to me. Olga? Yeah, I am thinking about the situations where you would need to like go into the paper and figure out if the title is actually about the paper or what's not. And I feel like one of the probably I'm just foreseeing is that one of the most uh, commonly frequent, most frequent issue might be people uh, confusing correlations and causations, right? So the people would say that X event, there is no experimental design within. So going into each paper and looking at experimental design and figuring out if it's actually manipulated or and not measured may seem like too much when there are like hundreds of papers uploaded. It might be okay for now, maybe, but I think we may need some other solution in the future. Yeah, I could see it getting overwhelmed for sure. I think right now, like, and, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like whenever I see titles, I can go into the abstract and get, like, you know, 90% accuracy of whether I need to read more, you know, like, pretty much understand. And then I think something we could do eventually, too, and we talk about this a lot and it's always, you know, just a matter of time, but like, I think ML could apply here where like, like there's the TLDR type thing. Uh, and I've even seen like explain like I'm five science where they'll just input a paper, come out with a paragraph, like the editorialized title feels like that could be automated, you know, in a like useful productive way where then the editor gets the computer generated editorialized title that they can then tweak themselves if they'd like or something like that, but in the future. All right, uh, looking at the time, we should probably move on to the next topic. So coming up soon, we have the AMA with Bianca Trovo organized by Satvik here. Uh, and 
discussion topic here, how editors and regular community members active on Slack can facilitate this process. Tatvik, are you here? Or would you like to say a few words about the, the guest? If not, that's fine. I can I can, I can take this on. Um, okay. I'm, I'm mainly, um, let's say I, I tried to attack uh, Bianca. Uh, I got like she got back to me last week, and um, she basically said that she was willing to come on the platform. But unfortunately, like since Friday, she hasn't like we were about to schedule basically the the time because she's in Europe, same as me. So we we're kind of like thinking about a potential time that could work better than 11 p.m. Uh, for us. Um, but then she didn't get back to me. So I'm planning, I wrote her again today. Uh, so I'm planning, I don't know, maybe could, like even use the, I don't know, the official research of account to reach out in, on Twitter. Um, that's, that's weird, but, uh, whatever. Um, if she still comes, uh, basically we posted the, uh, the main paper. She posted, basically she published two papers on answer view. One is from last year and one is like, is a seminal paper in 2019. Um, I put up a, a brief summary. I would like just like editors to maybe like go through it and put any questions that they, they might have. Because like in general, even if we are not able to gather for let's say next week, sure, she's still gonna you know come on the platform. So the more kind of like comments and feedbacks we get on the paper, uh, the better for for discussion. And then I would, I wanted her to maybe do a demo because she also has the, the platform, but like she, she said that basically they're more in a research kind of phase. So maybe she's not going to really show the demo, but again, we kind of like stop uh, communicating because she didn't uh, come back to me, but hope we're soon. soon. Do, are you thinking maybe a bounty perhaps for interesting conversation starter or something or do, do, do we expect the editors to just be intrinsically interested in this stuff yeah i discussed that with with Sadvik. uh i was totally down to put up a bounty for um you know for like, kind of like putting a, a question there i also find that you know maybe if you're interested in the topic you're still gonna read the paper and interact on the ama but yeah just tell me guys what do you, what do you think it's it's best here we could definitely put up a small bounty for for people to to contribute I think it makes sense to do that. I think every contribution you know, deserves some kind of compensation in theory. Um, the other thing I was thinking too is, do you think like, like, I think answer view is really cool and Bianca is a cool person and it might be worth like finding dedicated time, you know, when, when is most comfortable for her and we can like, you know, schedule an event around her schedule rather than like trying to bring her to a community call. Um, what, what do you think about that? Just if it's like, like I personally would prefer to do things like whenever is most convenient for her in theory. Yeah, that's, that's basically why I asked her if, she, you know, what, like what what time was best for her? Because I know 11 p.m. is okay for me that I'm doing my community call every every week, but maybe for her that she's coming on the platform is better to have something more like, I don't know, 6 p.m. could still work, I think. Uh, still talking like European time. So yeah, I, I asked her, I even sent her a, like a, like a schedule, scheduling tool, uh, but yeah, let's see. I hope she responds. Uh, but yeah, we can we can think about other way of reaching out to her. Um, and also, yeah. I was thinking about putting up basically the idea that I discussed with you, uh, Patrick, of having if we don't have the pot of gold already, uh, kind of like ready for her, maybe you know, kind of like a sort of like reward for having her on the platform would be probably pretty cool and kind of like incentivizing. Also, to like kind of like tie her to, you know, research job, having some research going, feeling part of the community and so on. Yeah, totally. I, I think we can 100% do that manually. Um, and then we should even set up like a regular bounty for like, you know, authors who come in and like do an AMA, like that should be like a, you know, a compensated thing as well. Um, and mm -hmm. yeah, Ricardo, I'll work with you afterwards and we'll get in touch with her and get something set up. Okay, great. Perfect. And once the bounties are figured out, uh, let's maybe pin them to the community channel on Slack. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if the AMA is going to be next week, I'll make sure to do it, I don't know, tomorrow. We can figure out uh, an amount and post it tomorrow. And so just to jump in while we we're talking about bounties, um, actually, Jeff uh, reached out to the founders of DWORK. And they want to jump on a community call, too, in order to like demo like how to most effectively use bounties. Um, so I think that he was thinking the 18th as well. So yeah, getting some guests to our community calls is kind of fun. Cool. 
All right. So next topic, ways to increase offer visibility. Uh, you might have noticed sometimes that th there is an active user posting in one particular paper and you have interacted with them. And then after you connect the dots, you realize it's actually the offer or one of the offers or, or from the paper that you are discussing. I think, and not just me, several users have suggested that, that uh, there should be visual ways to differentiate offers on the platform compared to other users and editors perhaps a badge or a frame or something of that sort. Obviously we would need to think through the implementation, right? So do we want the person to be visually distinct from other users only specifically when interacting in the comment section to the papers they have offered or maybe in all papers, just so we you know, boost their ego a little bit, even if they are you know, hanging around other uh, areas and papers. Uh, to incentivize people to submit their papers more on Research Hub. There are pros and cons, obviously, to both solutions. So interesting to hear what you all think about this. So I, I, I could be wrong, but I think we actually do distinguish authors right now. If if we have the, the paper claimed, like they have like a little green kind of like badge next to their name in the comment section that says author. Um, oh. I think for, for the example that happened, that person hadn't claimed their paper yet. Mm. So it's kind of like the issue of like, why are you, why, you know, hasn't made it clear to this person that they can claim their paper and like get the author kind of, you know, visual credentialing. Um, I'm trying to find a paper right now that has it so that way I can share screen and show you guys, but. It's Inter good. Interesting. I mean, we can discuss different implementations in either way, uh, but what is it right now? Is it only visible in the comment section of the corresponding paper or all papers? Yeah, I believe so. I believe it's like if you're the author of the paper, then when you comment on it, kind of like the editors have an editor badge, the author has an author badge. Okay. Yes, we do. Uh, I, Just yeah, I can confirm that's the case because that's on my paper as well. In the comment section, it will show a gold badge saying author. I can, I'll share a screen just to show. Here's a paper that has it. And I still think like feedback on this is important because um, we've even talked about how we think it's like, as I mentioned earlier, um, honoring the authors who did like the actual work on the paper is a lot more important than the submitter. And so this is a, an editor who authored this paper here. And um, they have like a little like, you know, author and editor badge um, in order to distinguish it. Oh, yeah. You could probably make that cooler, though, right? <laughs> yeah, what, what do you guys have in mind when it comes to, like, like how should authors be distinguished on the page? This is a, like a V1, very early, quick thing. Um, well, that probably would have to tie in with, like, your general plan for rewarding behavior that's desirable. You know, like, there's, like, a combination of, like, NFTs and fungible tokens there that, you know, kind of have to think through and figure out the best way to do that. So I, I don't, I don't think a, any really good idea would happen sort of in isolation to, from that entire scheme. That makes any sense. So you're thinking like, this is something that could tie into when we eventually build in NFTs um, for, for papers. Yeah, to, well, kind of authorship I, benefit. So I've been, I've been paying a little bit more attention to just like, how games are evolving in this space and basically you're you're incentivizing behavior that is good for the space with either nfts that give you access to more resources or actual capital um and there's different ways you can sort of um you can sort of make that apparent i suppose if that's something that that um you know the platform is interested in but i, I think if you're talking about um you know, something like publication and how is how you would like, how you would basically have somebody stand out for doing so. I don't I can't say off the top of my head like what might be a good way to do that. Because I feel like it has to fit in like a broader scheme of how you wanna, you know. One thing I'm hearing here which is like kinda interesting is like um so maybe I'm an author and it's like I'm browsing Research Hub. 
And yeah. I have to have the authorship NFT of a paper in order to be able to edit the editorialized title. Like, like I get extra moderation privileges purely because sure. I hold this NFT for this specific paper in my wallet. And then maybe sure. like my profile picture, like if I'm on Anton's paper, you know, it's just my regular profile picture. But then as soon as I navigate to my paper, you know, the system recognizes I have the authorship NFT and then my profile picture is like surrounded in gold or something like that, you know, or like, yeah, and there's also like things you can do, like the NFT could be upgradable based on other types of desirable behavior on the platform. Um, and like, so you were talking about how, um, you know, based on the amount of upvotes you get or the amount of tokens to people, like a percentage of the uh, money from the platform is basically going to go to you, where we could have tiers with that, right? Where, because to some extent, you're subject to competition. Um, when that's the case, but there could be like a tier where you're not subject to competition and mm. you want to get there. So there are a lot of things that we could do with N NFTs that and I think we could learn a lot from the gaming industry here in terms of just like incentivizing behavior we want in the ecosystem. And I think we have to be really comprehensive um, in how we think about that um, and deploy that. And that makes any sense. It makes a ton of sense. And I, I think you're absolutely right in that like, learning from how like games are using nfts is probably like a ton of insight there um it's funny i actually got a twitter dm today about some like conference specifically for academic nfts so i'll share that in the community channel because i think a lot of people here you know want to maybe join and comment on like how these could be implemented um edwin I, I will definitely once we start doing like nft design work i'll loop you into those conversations because i think like yeah we need to hear there's just so many different ways that we could do it we need to like lay them all out on paper and like actually vote on like what's the best thing like what's the most promising thing to start with yeah um if i would um so a, a really good sort of intro to this space if i had to recommend anything there's this new application called steppen i don't know if you guys have heard anything about it but they basically reward you for running mm -hmm. um and I don't know, like when you take time to actually understand what their incentives are and what they're trying to get you to do, it sort of gets you thinking about that space more broadly. So if there's sort of like a nice thing that you could step into that you would be involved with a little bit consistently over time to get your head around that idea, I would say to look into using that application. It's like S-T-E-P-N. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. Um... My friend made me go on a seven mile run yesterday, so I might as well be getting paid for it. <laughs> like that's a, I've always thought that was a great idea. And that could like actually work into healthcare where you'd save money, you know, by making people healthier and paying them to do so. Um cool. That's a great suggestion, Edwin. I'll definitely look into this. Thank you for sharing. All right, we have a queue here. N Nick. It's uh it's kind of awesome. So the thing that I was thinking about mentioning is being echoed in the comments up here too. So it's good to see we're thinking similarly, but I think the the author badge looks great. Maybe just you know a little bit more pop off the page. Maybe a frame or you know like a an underline that goes across the whole comment or something would be cool. Um, one thing it's just an idea. Um, what would be neat to do is if that author is commenting on other papers, there's some sort of badge next to their profile, just a small ones like they have on Reddit that says that they're a verified author on Research Hub. Um, so then they kind of have that uh, with them whenever they go somewhere else. But definitely when they're commenting on their own paper, it gets pushed um, further than, than other comments. I would like to echo that. Uh, absolutely great idea. I was also thinking about that, that the presence or like your status as an author or content creator, whatever it, the title would be, needs to be less silent when you're outside of your hub and papers, but still be there, right? I think it would mean a lot to offers. Uh, there were uh, Maulik and Nathan, I think, also. Yeah, I was uh, mainly going to mention that, like, um, I think, uh, Anton, you or Satwik mentioned that the entire comment just shows up as a different color from the author. That would really help. And uh, since you guys earlier mentioned about the step on uh, thing about, you know, incentivizing like exercise, I like, currently, you know, insurance companies do that already. Like you can actually have your insurance company pay for your gym membership. Um, so 
that's um, you know something similar incentive that I think would work. Um, yeah. Yeah, and it's really interesting because that platform, you know, they're obviously like printing money to give to people for running. So you have to counter that in a lot of ways, right? Incentivizing people to reinvest, but then also bringing money into there. So I think working with healthcare providers, working with uh, content providers, like different product people will be a way of like bringing a lot of money into their ecosystem to manage inflation. It's really interesting to watch. Have you all seen like on Reddit sometimes, I've seen this like in the last year, they do like this, like, for a specific comment, they'll kind of like highlight it in very light red. Like it's like a fire thing. It's like, oh, there's a hot comment or whatever. And it's like very, very light red background, but it draws your eye when you're scrolling. Is that kind of what you're thinking for author comments? Like maybe it's very, very light green or something like that and you automatically go there visually? Yeah, yeah. And also, also Olga suggested something that offers maybe Maybe their comments are automatically at the top, or maybe let them pin some comments or their comments or something like that. I honestly, the more agency uh, the offers have, the, the better. That's who we need to attract, right? Yeah, I like it a lot. Yeah, I like it a lot. I think there's we got to make sure that like you can criticize a paper, you know, so authors can't like delete stuff because maybe that's like editors who are responsible for that. But I totally agree that like authors need to have the control over how their work appears to the world, essentially. Malik? Yeah, one more small comment. Like, so right now, like, let's say if you have posted a paper um, and, you know, you get like this, um, if somebody made a comment, you get an email notification about it. Um, so like, if you are the author, then maybe get like a, a special different type of, so that, you know, people can turn off the notifications, but at least, that can be a separate way so that that notification is always on or something so that the author is kind of, you know, involved with their paper. And so that would allow the community to discuss it better, I guess. Just to repeat that back, you're saying like there's two different classes of notifications. Like one is someone's commenting on your paper versus like someone's commenting on a paper you commented on and you could toggle them differently, have different controls. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I think we can definitely do that. All right, any more thoughts on the offer visibility? Okay, I see transfer flow. So one of the users suggested that maybe perhaps there could be improvements in how the, the current wallet situation is handled. Patrick, can you bring light to the situation? Maybe do you plan in the future to have some sort of integrations with uh, wallets and whatnot? And so it's you know more seamless for users to push their uh, RC around. Yeah, I guess I, I'd like to hear like um, sort of like what the ideal flow would be. Cause I think we're, at least to my understanding, we're limited by like the realities of having an on-chain asset where you like need to withdraw it to your own account. But there is a possibility that we could do something where like we integrate our backend, you know, with uh, like, I guess, infrastructure in Ethereum where we could like, um, like credit people, I guess, but that seems complicated as well and like risky and yeah, like, like a great place for a vulnerability security wise. Um, so yeah, I guess I'd like to hear like in theory, what would be the perfect flow that people would like want to have based on the tools that are currently available? So why don't people like the current, like I find it very easy to just transfer money from the site to my wallet. And then, you know, you can transfer kind of co to whatever coin you want from MetaMask, it seems. Um, like, is that, like, what what have been the complaints? Uh, give me a second. Uh, I'll need to go a few weeks back. But... And, yeah, just for early, like, for the editor survey, um, based on the results, and I have a majority of people responding, I didn't see that, like, the RSC transfer mentioned as a problem, at least not as, like, a pervasive one. So one thing that I do think here is that like even the like UX of having to withdraw to an Ethereum wallet, like if I'm not Web3 native, 
like now I got to download MetaMask and like figure that out. And that kind of sucks. So like if there was a way to like, I don't know, somehow make that easier for people, like maybe we automatically spin up wallets for them or something. Yeah, I'm not sure, but that's, that's like a challenging UX thing that I think a lot of uh, Web3 projects are like, you know, just dealing with at the moment and hopefully a fix comes out, but yeah, curious if there's anything we can do to make it better. So the the issue was with the delay between the transfer from uh, Research Hub to MetaMask and the delay where when the RSC has already been shipped from the platform and hasn't appeared in the MetaMask yet. That, that's, that moment seems to bother people. I don't know if there is anything that can be done to amend the situation. I think there is if we make it clear that you can check Aether scan and watch your transaction unfolding. Like it again, like I get what Patrick's saying, where you know, I'm not thinking of it from the perspective of somebody who's not, you know, you know, savvy with this kind of thing. But I guess I'm also thinking that cryptocurrency at this point, again, like Patrick said, it just kind of requires at least some sort of, you know, internet savvy. So like we could make it super clear that like your transfer will be initiated. You can click here. You can watch the transfer occurring. Like, don't worry, it's happening. Maybe just like spelling out to make it like super easy. And I guess we haven't had any sort of like, you know, instructional thing for people, but maybe just making the instructions super clear could help because I, again, I think they are super clear. And even if we generated wallets for people, they would still need to learn how to like log into their wallet, you know, understand how to transfer. So maybe just making it super easy to teach people a video demo, anything like that. Um, I guess it's hard to do a video demo without like showing a transfer to a real wallet though. I don't know. I don't know how you would do a video demo. Yeah, I have a uh, I have a set of Web3 resources that I put up. I pinned it to the community and the editor um, channels on Slack. So those all have like screenshots so you could see like kind of really easily how to withdraw out of your um, Research Hub account and into your MetaMask wallet. Um, I think like the delay in time is just intrinsic to like us being an ERC20 token on Ethereum. There's like Ethereum's a pretty like uh, congested network, so it takes some time, some time for the like token to get into your wallet. So that's just innate to it being an ERC twenty token. And if like something that the community would feel like might be worthwhile is to also have it be on some kind of like other chain as well in tandem. So like on Polygon or like something like that, where the fees are really cheap and they move a lot quicker. Uh, that could be like kind of a solution, but uh, might not be too too quick of a solution, like to establish all that stuff. It's also hard too, because then, like in theory, the people who this like bothers are the ones who don't know a ton about Ethereum, right? And so then you got to ask those people to then like buy Matic and use Polygon, and so that's it's just a hard thing. I think like yeah, I, everybody's hoping Ethereum two point like scales and it'll be fast and cheap but um yeah until that happens it hasn't yet so um it's it's an interesting problem one thing we could do um which is kind of what we're doing now with the new paper upload flow is there's kind of like a completion bar to like tell you like what's happening in the background like as your paper is being uploaded and so we could do something similar where like when you withdraw we could have like a little progress bar or something like that that's like reading confirmations on etherscan and then like once it's done it could be like your transfer is completed you know and then check your metamask it feels like a like a like a cherry on the cake type of feature so maybe not like super necessary at the moment but i could see that being kind of nice for people um who may be unfamiliar with how ethereum works nick Uh, I, I agree that for, for people that may not understand the whole thing, having a little visual aid, no matter how, like, you know, on an elevator, the door close button doesn't actually do anything. It's there for people's comfort and just giving them that something to trust. I think, um, and I, this is, I don't know how advanced this would have to be, but could it be possible when you click your research coin and it brings up the withdrawal and deposit, there's a third tab that says sell? and integrate it with Uniswap. I don't know how complex that would 
would be or anything. I was just, just curious. I think it. I I think that is possible. Like, I don't think that Research Hub Inc. is allowed to do that because you start getting into weird like money transmitter laws and yeah, it's it's legally. I'd have to like talk to lawyers to see if we can. But my gut feeling is you can't. I know people have like built like anonymous third party like Chrome extensions where you can like on Twitter like plug it in and anytime you see a cash tag of a coin and you hover over it and like the Uniswap swap thing will come up. So yeah, if we start to build out like a robust open source developer community, like it's entirely possible something like that could be built by someone not affiliated with Research Hub on top of Research Hub. Like we couldn't stop that. But um, yeah, I think at the moment, and I also think the laws might change over the next three years, or at least there will be clarity into like what you can and can't do. And so, yeah, eventually, if that's legal, that would be amazing. <laughs> you know, one one click is always the best. But um, yeah, I think right now it's there's some other variables, you know, that make it challenging to try and like facilitate trades. Okay, gotcha. Thanks, Malik. Yeah, well, while we are on this topic, I, I just also wanted to ask about like, you know, when there is that uh, community voting, um, you know, where we have to transfer the research coin. Um, I think the first two words, it was like, there was no way to select like how many tokens you want to put in the vote. Um, like, you know, when I tried to vote, there were like, I don't know, like eight, nine million votes already for like token votes for all, for one of the sides. And there was hardly anything for other. And I was like, okay, I transferred 5,000. Like, is my vote going to matter? Like, I, I know that's not the ideal thing, but like, I was just thinking through back of my mind, like, can I select less tokens or more? I don't think there was an easy option unless I don't know of. So is that something that can be fixed or not? Or... So that that's through snapshot. And I think you can choose how many tokens you want to vote with. I'm not very familiar with snapshot though. So I would trust me at like 10%. Uh, Jeffrey, do you know if you can do that on snapshot? Have you done that before? Yeah, so it depends on the way that we design. Um, so like when a vote, like a formal vote goes live, um, you can choose the um, you can choose the voting option for it. So like what we've been doing is just like a basic vote option, which is just for, against, and abstain. And when you choose that option, it only allows you to vote with the maximum amount of like tokens that you have uh, in the wallet at that given moment. Um, and so there are other options that we could choose from. Like uh, there's like a, a weighted voting option where I think you can distribute, say you had um, 10,000 research coin, you can distribute that among the different options but because the options are just generally like a yes, no, and abstain, um, there's, I guess there's like not really a point in waiting it because it's either you're for it or you're against it or you don't really care. But if it was something where it was like, you know, you had five options, then we can do a weighted system where you can divvy up your, your, um, your votes. And Thank you. Thank you so much for explaining that. And one follow-up question for that. So would you recommend that we, like for every time there is a vote that that's when we only transfer it there so that because it's going to be the maximum that's going on the vote yeah so um the way that it works and the reason why it's called snapshot is um when the vote goes live it takes a snapshot of however much research coin is in your actual wallet so a lot of people they keep trying to transfer research coin after the vote went live um, and that's not going to work because the snapshot has already been taken um so just keep that in mind too um because uh yeah i guess like one 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 good thing to do is if you do want to vote when it goes up on the governance proposal channel um to discuss with the community the vote will probably go to a formal vote sometime within a few days after that so that'd be a good time to move your coins to your wallet if you wanted to vote great thanks thank you for explaining that Another thing I was just thinking too, Malik, um, like you could move your coins to multiple wallets. So maybe you want to have like a light vote wallet where it's like 10%, like a medium vote where it's like 50% or, you know, you can put them in different wallets and vote from different wallets depending on how involved you want to be in the given vote. Great. Good to know. Thanks. All right. Any closing thoughts before we close the meeting?
Actually, yeah. So um, about the spreadsheet in its current form, do we want to make that available to just editors now? Because um, since sending out the poll, I've already gotten like multiple emails asking me like, when is this going to go live? You know, when can we, you know, swap, et cetera. So I don't know if we want to make this available or we want to wait on that. But um, yeah, that's just what I want to know. I think putting it out for um, editors, at least right now, um, and then like maybe we can have uh, a group of like editors come to a consensus on if we want to push it to the community as well. Um, but I think quickly now for editors, because you know there's a lot of people that do want to sell and a couple people that want to buy, so I think they'll be okay. All right. Great. Well, thank you all for coming. I will see you all next week. Good to see you, everybody. Bye.